Okay. Um, can we? Is it possible to close the door back there? Okay. Uh, welcome back. We are here with Eric Jensen, and we'll talk about data model patterns with SQL Alchemy. Eric, okay. the show is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Eric Janssens. I'm the main developer of the Camelot project, which is a, a graphical library on top of SQL Alchemy models. Um, for a living, I develop SQL Alchemy and Camelot applications, and I've been doing so for the last six years, I think. So uh, when I started with SQL Alchemy six years ago, um, I really liked the basic concepts behind it, but I found it way too difficult. I didn't understand all the documentation, and I found that I had to write uh, lots of code to get something done. So I started looking around on the internet, and I found the Elixir library at the time. And the Elixir library promised uh, to make it easy to build, to make data model patterns on top of SQL Alchemy. And it made the use of SQL Alchemy a lot easier. So I started using this Elixir library. Years passed, and uh, I had a huge code base of Elixir classes and, and Elixir related stuff. But SQL Alchemy moved on in the meantime, and um, there came the declarative module, which made it a lot easier to work uh, with SQL Alchemy. And the Elixir library was left without maintenance. Uh, one of the issues with the Elixir library was as well that um, it was not documented how it actually worked internally. So we did great things, but you didn't know how it did, how it did those things. And I had this huge code base I had to convert one way or another from Elixir to Declarative. So I started to look at the implementation of Declarative and at the implementation of Elixir. I discovered uh, really interesting things. Um, and I made some, uh, some classes on top of Declarative that allowed me to use all the Elixir magic within Declarative. So, this presentation, in a, in a way, serves as a, as a documentation of how Elixir worked, so that, this, uh, that everybody can, can have a look at, uh, at uh, what was behind Elixir and how it was done. So, okay. Okay. So, what will I talk about? First, we have a quick uh, look at what the declarative extension within SQL Alchemy actually is and what it does. Then we look at how type definitions work in Python. So um, I will actually talk about meta classes without mentioning the word meta class. So it will be a little bit of meta talk about meta classes. Then we'll have a look at how declarative is implemented. Because if as a user you use declarative, it's magic, it's fantastic, but how does it actually work? Maybe, maybe one day you want to know how it actually works. Then we'll have a look at what a data model pattern is. And then we'll look at how we can customize declarative to easily implement data model patterns. And we'll do so with an example. So what is SQL Alchemy? SQL Alchemy, it's actually two libraries combined in one library. On the one hand, it's a, it's a Python SQL toolkit. It allows you to manipulate SQL queries uh, and makes it easy to write complicated uh, SQL queries. That's, that's one part of the library. The other part is an object relational mapper. And the object re with the object relational mapper, you can, you can use it in the typical active record pattern. For example, you have a person table, you have a person class, the table maps to a class, each row in the table corresponds to an object in, your, in, your, uh, in Python. That's easy. It's, it's the active record pattern everybody knows. Now, what is so nice about the SQL Alchemy ORM, it doesn't ties you to this, to this way of mapping um, objects to the database. It allows you a lot of flexibility so that your object model and your SQL model 
can grow separately and you can use SQL for what it's good for. You can use object-oriented programming for what it's good for and you tie both of them together through the ORM without having the limitation that either your SQL model should map exactly to your object model or the other way around. So you can keep the strengths of both techniques uh, while using SQL Alchemy. So what is the declarative extension? The declarative extension allows you to define the table we saw, if you look here. So here we have actually three things. We have the table, we have the class, and we have the mapping between the table and the class. And declarative allows you to define those three things in one class declaration. So you declare a person class, its subclasses base, base which is the declarative base class. So it's indicating that this class is a, should be mapped to, um, to a table. You give it a table name, you define some uh, columns, and then you can just use normal properties or, or methods, things like that. And you have defined a class, a table, and the mapping between both. So that's, it's magic. What should you do without declarative? Without declarative, you should define your class, first of all. Then you should define a table. And then you define the mapper between both of them. So the question is, if you want to know how declarative works, we want to know how we can define, where we can declare one class and create two objects while we are declaring a single class. Now, let's have a look at, at types in Python. If, if you read your favorite lecture, namely the Python language reference, you will, you will find sentences like this. All data in a Python program is represented by objects or by relations between objects. So far, so good. <coughs> then it says, every object has an identity, a type, and a value. That's, that's something to remember. Every object has an identity, a type, and a value. And how do you define a new type? There are two ways in Python to, def to do so. Yeah? You can declare a class, which is what I did on the top. Yeah? Or you can use the built-in type function to declare a new type. First, you give it the name of the type a tuple with the uh, classes it should inherit from, <coughs> and then a dictionary, and this dictionary becomes the under under dict of the new class. So actually that's nice because here we can define classes in a dynamic way, so that opens possibilities. We are on the right, on the right path to implement declarative ourselves. So if type definitions can be dynamic, um, Instead of um, defining um, the class and the table separately, we can try and first here, so we define a dictionary, which will become the under under dict of our class. And we put some, uh, we fill it with columns, column objects. Then we can define our class by using this dictionary. Yeah, and then we write a little function called as declarative, and it takes the dict as an argument. It looks in the dict. Yeah, first it creates a table object based on the table name that was in the dict. If there is a an instance of a column in the dict, it appends this column to the table. When it's finished, it creates a mapper between the table and the class. Okay, we call as declarative. So now we have defined table, class, and mapping at once. Only the syntax is not that, that nice. So uh, we're not at the end of the search yet. So let's think about what a class declaration is. Again, in the Python language reference, it says, a class definition is an executable statement. It first evaluates the inheritance list. The class suit is then executed 
using a newly created local namespace. A class object is then created using the inheritance list and the saved local namespace. <coughs> what does that mean? So let's try it out in the terminal. Open up Python. So first it says a class declaration is an executable statement. Let's try that. We define a new class. Yeah. Object. Print. Okay, it's executed. So it's an executable statement. I, I can understand that. I can... Uh, I can remember that. Now it also says it creates a new local namespace. Well, when I started with Python, I often abused the locals built-in function. So let's see if I can do that now. I say x equals 4. Print locals. OK. So actually, this class declaration uh, at the start, it created this local namespace, and I can see it if I print locals, what's in it? it, it it's x equals 4, and it also contains the module name. Okay, so now we really understand class declarations. But what happens next? Again, you look in the Python language reference uh, on some other page, and there it says... If there is at least one base class, the type of this base class is called as if the built-in function type is called. Okay. So what does it do when I declare a class A? It looks at the type of the, of the first um, base class, so in this case object. So it looks at the type of object and then it calls the type of object as if built-in function type was called. Now, what is the type of object? Type. It's the built-in function type. So it actually calls the built-in function type. It's not as if. It does it. So, uh, we are object-oriented programmers. We have this built-in function type. What is type? It's an object. Everything in Python is an object. Yeah? So, um, we can subclass it. We subclass type, yeah? And we create a new uh, type named declarative type, which is a subclass of type. And in the under under init method, we're going to take in um, the same arguments as those that are given to the built-in type function, namely the name of the class, and base classes, and the dictionary. Once we have this, we call, our, we call our as declarative function on this dictionary. Yeah? This will loop over the dictionary, look in the columns that are in it, and create um, a mapper and a table uh, like what we wanted to do. And then we call the init function of type to finish it cleanly. Yeah? So now we have a declarative type clause. We can instantiate it, and we call this instantiation uh, base. Uh, so base is actually an instantiation of declarative type. What happens now? If um, we subclass base to create our person object, yeah? so according to the language reference, the inheritance list is evaluated. So it looks what... Um, the base classes of person is, in this case, it's base. Local namespace is filled. And then the type of base is called with this information. So in this case, the type of base is declarative type. Yeah? So actually, declarative type is called, um, which evaluates the dictionary because of the as declarative call. So by declaring this person class, we now have um, defined, the, declared the class, and have a mapper and um, a table class. So actually, we now 
uh, re-implemented declarative in 10 lines of Python code. In reality, declarative, is a, the declarative code is a lot longer to handle uh, special cases and, and corner cases or handle inheritance and things like that. But those 10 lines of code are the basics of, of how the declarative module is implemented. Now, there are some other nice things you can do with declarative. One of the nice things is, oh, no, that's not, uh, not that fast. Okay, this is something nice that declarative can do as well. When you define a person class, you declare the person class, so you have the table, uh, the mapper, and the class, yeah? You did that, but somewhere else in your code, you want to modify this class and this mapper and this table, yeah? Then you can do person dot a new field name, and you can add a new column to it, yeah? When you do so, the table is updated with a new column, and the mapper is updated as well. So that's actually a, a really handy function uh, when you want to avoid um, dependencies uh, within your code. But how does it work? What is person? It's an object. Everything is an object in Python, so person is an object. When you say person.ssn equals something, what are you actually doing? You're calling under under set etter on the object, yeah? So in this case, under under set etter is called, and where is it defined? In the type of object, so in, in the declarative type. Ah, again. <laughs> ah. So this is how it's implemented. In declarative type, you define under under set etter, yeah? you get a key and a value in. If the value is a column, you append the column to the table and you append uh, the mapping between the column and the property to the mapper and you're done. So that's how easy it is to implement this magic. Okay, now we move on to data model patterns. Um, everybody knows design patterns. It's something like factory and singleton and all these things um, given to us by the gang of four. And they make our life a lot easier in terms of communication with each other. And, and um, yeah, they just make it easier because somebody else already um, tried those patterns and found out what works in which case and what doesn't so we can reuse all this work. The same thing exists for databases, and they are called data model patterns. They have the same advantages as design patterns. We can use them to illustrate and, and communicate with each other. They are a good foundation for database design because somebody else already solved the, uh, the hard things and uh, tried those patterns in various scenarios. So uh, one of the advantages that it, it provides you with a standard to keep your data model consistent. If you're building a large data model, you want to use the same patterns everywhere so that the model is consistent. If somebody new has to study your model, um, he can work in quite easily. Another advantage is that with SQL Alchemy, we can automate the use of these, of these patterns so we can uh, grow our data model uh, more easily. A good reference on those data model patterns is the book uh, Universal Patterns for Data Modeling by Len Silverstone. Um, it's, a, it's a very good book. Okay, try to press the right key. Okay. okay. We'll have a look at an example pattern, namely the status pattern. What is a status? It's the state at a particular point in time of an object or a row in your table. For example, if we have a, an object, a sales order, yeah? imagine your company, um, a sales order arrives by fax, so <coughs> fax comes in, you have the sales order, somebody enters it in the computer, yeah? prints it out, um, faxes it back to the customer to say, yeah, we, we received it. So 
A sales order goes um, through various states. It's received, it's confirmed to the customer. Maybe the customer then uh, receives your confirmation and gives you a call, oh, it was a mistake, the sales order was for somebody else. You cancel it or it's correct and somebody at your company ships the sales order so the status changes again to shipped. Yeah? Notice that there are different actions at a certain point in time which make the status change. Yeah? And if we model the status in our data model, we should be able to answer common questions like from, from management, for example, how many orders did we receive this week? Yeah? It's a common question and the system should be able to answer it. Or how long does it take on average to confirm an order? So that's why if you look at a typical database structure, you will see a lot of date or date time fields. And most of the time, those are actually hidden status fields. So let's try to implement this status thing uh, within declarative. We'll do it really easy. We add a bunch of columns, each one for each status, and they have the type date. So whenever um, an order is received, if it's received, we fill in the date of the reception in the column. When we confirm it, we fill in um, the confirmation date again in the column, uh, in the confirmed column. Now, this is easily, it's easy, but it has a number of problems. Yeah? On one hand, we can, we can answer those questions that were asked, but this, this way of implementing it has a number of problems. For example, suppose your application is used at multiple companies and some company has another type of status that you, didn't, uh, you don't have in your application. Yeah, what, what are you going to do? Um, should the user add his, his own column to your database model? It's difficult. Um, another problem is, suppose you receive an order, yeah, you confirm it, and the customer replies with uh, a slightly modified version of the order. What happens then? Did you receive the order twice? What are you going to do with this uh, received field? Are you going to update it? Then you don't know anymore um, when the order was first received. So things become quickly complicated when using this strategy. A more flexible implementation of, of a status as defined as, as, in, as uh, given in data model patterns is you have your order, yeah? then your order is a table, you have your order status type table, which is a list of the different statuses an order can have. Um, so it's a table on its own. So users of your application could add rows to that table. And then you have a table order status history, which is a relation between order and order status type. And order status history actually tells you um, what the status of the order was at which particular point in time. So every time the status changes of your object, you just add a new line to your status history table. Um, and that, that's a more flexible pattern. It has its drawbacks as well. It doesn't enforce business rules as clearly as the, as the previous model. So you have to do more enforcement at the application level. But in general, it's a flexible thing. Now, if you have a, a large data model, you will have maybe sales order, purchase orders, invoices, shipments, maybe many objects, and all those objects must have statuses. So what are you going to do? Are you going to declare this status type column each time or declare the order status history each time? No, we are developing with Python. So we want to do something really simple. We want to be able to, when we declare our model, we want to be able to say, okay, this order class, it has a status, status equals status, that's it. Now, could we do such thing with declarative? The Elixir library did it before us. They, they made it possible to do things like this. So we should be able to do this on top of declarative as well. And it's not that difficult. Remember the as declarative um, function that we created, which just looks at everything in the dictionary 
and then takes some action uh, for it. So we can use this, this logic to evaluate um, status or other data model pattern things as well. So the genius of the Alexir library was in a class called Entity Builder. And Entity Builder, um, each Entity Builder was actually an implementation of a specific pattern. Yeah? It had some methods. The attach method, which attaches an Entity Builder to a certain class. Yeah? And then it had a bunch of methods like create primary key columns, create non-primary key columns, create properties. In the context of SQL Alchemy, properties are things like uh, relations between objects. So on the one hand, you have your non-primary key columns, which are, for example, foreign key columns, and properties are the object layer on top of the foreign key, so the relation uh, represented by the foreign key. Now, this is a blank slide. It's very interesting. Um, OK. So we modify our as declarative function, and um, we'll modify it as such that each time that it sees an entity builder in the class dictionary, it attaches it to the entity. So the entity builder knows for which, uh, on which class it's operating. And what it then does, um, at the end of your model definition, yeah, it loops over all your entity builders and it creates and it calls the various methods um, for each of the entity builders. Now, why does it work that way? Why does it call these methods for each builder um, in this order? Why not just loop over the builder and create and call the three methods uh, consecutive? It's because it's a kind of global setup. If you want to create your non-primary key columns, which might be foreign key columns, it's needed that the primary key columns are already created in your model. Yeah? And it might be that you have entity builders that modify the primary key of your, of your model. So you first need to create all primary keys for your complete data model. Only then you can create all non-primary keys and only afterwards you can create all your properties. So that's, that's the genius of the Alexir library of, of handling it this way. Now, how do we create a status entity builder? Remember that we need the status type and the status history. So when we attach the status to uh, a class, we're going to create the status type class and the status history class. Why would we um, create those classes using the type built in, and why don't we use uh, a simple class declaration? Reason to do so is if you call the type built in, you can customize the name yeah, of your class, and that makes it easy if you're debugging your code because if you use this entity builder um, in multiple for multiple objects, like for orders, for invoices, for shipments, you would have the same class name for different tables, and it would make debugging uh, a lot more difficult. That's why we use the built-in type uh, method. So let's have a look at the complete implementation of this status thing. Just go do page down. So this is the entity builder. Okay, this is the complete implementation. So in the attach method, yeah. We define the status type and the status history class. Each of them has a primary key and a number of columns. Notice that we don't yet create the foreign key columns in here. Yeah? <coughs> then there is the create primary key columns. We do nothing because we already defined them. 
And then we create the non-primary key columns, in this case the foreign key columns. In status history, we give it a reference to the status type, which is just uh, an integer. And then for a reference to the primary keys of the order column, we don't know what those types are because they might have been created or modified by another entity builder. So we just loop over the primary key columns and for each primary key column, we find in the table, we create a foreign key column in our related table. In the properties, uh, in the create properties method, um, we create here the status type. We create properties at the level of the status history. Yeah? So here, status history. We add the property status type which is a relationship to the status type uh, object. And we create a property status of, which is a relationship in this case to the order object. And we give it a back reference so that we can from the order access the status history. And then as a bonus point, uh, okay, this is difficult to read. Um, we add um, an SQL query as a current status property. So we create an SQL query that gets us the current, the status at, at the current point in time and map it uh, to an object in the, to property of the object. So for this, we also add a property to the mapper. Yeah. To then use this entity builder, we just use status equals status in the class declaration. When all our classes are declared, uh, we call setup model, which will call all the entity builders and do the modifications needed. And then we can start using it. So um, in this example, I create an engine, uh, a database engine use SQLite in memory. And then um, I'm going to use metadata create all to create all tables and we'll have a look at what it does. Let's stop the script here. See what's happening. So if we now call the, the script, yeah, you see that um, first the right on top of the screen, the order table is created, then the order status type is created and then the order status history is created with uh, foreign key references to the two other tables. So um, with this uh, simple entity builder, we can easily create two tables for the price of one. Um, this is uh, what I already showed. And then um, we'll use this uh, in our application. So this is how you use it then. We create an order. We add this order to the SQL Alchemy session. Um, in the entity builder, I have set the status type class and the status history class as attributes of the order. So, you can, so I can easily access those types uh, from within the order itself. I create a new um, order uh, status type for the order, namely with the status delivered. And then I create uh, the status history um, for uh, to connect delivered to the order at a certain point in time. And look what we do here. We set the from date of the history to func.current date. Why, why would we do so? Why don't we just call date time dot date dot today? Excuse me?
but the generic date that will be computed on the time of execution. Okay, that would be that's a good possibility. That's a good possibility. The the reason why I why I did it here is because you want to use the date of the database, yeah, which might be different than uh, the date on the machine on which you are running um, the code. And then you commit the session, and everything is um, is written to the database. And at the end, I can use the current status. Um, property to get the current status of the order object. Uh, I'll show you the code running. So. Okay, so if we execute the code, you see here uh, the beginning of the transaction. That's the SQL that is executed. Here you see uh, the insertion in the order status type table. Um, here you see the insertion into the order table. And then um, the insertion in the status history table um, with uh, the use of the SQL function current date and then the commit of the transaction. And then SQL Alchemy automatically does um, this uh, select query when we request the current date. Uh, it actually automatically fetches uh, this for us from the database and the result is delivered. So, um, what can you use this technique for as well? Of course, for um, other data model patterns in, in the book, there are um, also data model patterns for defining types uh, of objects, for defining categories, for associating uh, people or roles with objects, and all those things you can easily implement uh, with an entity builder. So some references are the SQL Alchemy website. The Elixir website is still up and running, so you can still have a look at, at how it works, at the code. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's no longer maintained. On the Python Camelot website, you can find um, the layer on top of Declarative, which, has, which implements all the Elixir features. And at the website uh, universaldata.com, uh, you find uh, information and books on, on those um, data model patterns. So this concludes uh, this overview of uh, declarative and data model patterns. Questions? Why do you need to, to define a table name uh, attribute when you define a new table? Uh, can't you get the class name to... Yeah, get you, you can do that. Um, that was actually done in Elixir. The reason why it's not done uh, in declarative is because in case of inheritance. So if you have, uh, in, in, in SQL Alchemy, you can implement, implement inheritance in, in three different ways. So either you're going to use the same table and extend the table with new fields. Uh, you're going to use a completely different table yeah, with, the same, with the same base fields. Or you're going to use uh, two tables to define one object. And by, by, using this, by specifying this table name, SQL is what it, what it should do. So that's, that's the reason why it's, uh, why it's done, to make, to make that scenario consistent. Hello, uh, thank you for your talk. I just have a question on the status history table. What is the through date field for? The through date field for is for uh, when the object enters this status. 
Ah, the true date, excuse me, not the from date. The true date is for when the object exits the status. And it has two reasons. Um, the first reason, you could say, okay, you can just um, not have the true date and then um, just see if there is an, another record with a from date that is later on, yeah? Doing so, um, it has two drawbacks. It would make your queries a lot more difficult, yeah? That's one drawback. The other drawback is that you then cannot have two statuses at the same time, yeah? So in some uh, modeling patterns, you want your object to be able to have two statuses at the same time. An order can, for example, be processed in the sales department and it can be processed in the production department at the same time and it can have different statuses for those different uh, departments. So that's, that's the reason. And um, what is also good practice is to always put in a value in this true date field. So you could also say, okay, I'm leaving this value to none uh, if I don't yet know when the status ends, which, which is in, in, in SQL logic uh, perfectly fine. Uh, but the drawback is again, it will make your queries a lot more difficult. So if you make the field required and you put in a ridiculous, a ridiculous late date, um, then it makes your queries a lot, a lot easier. So when you change the status, you update the, that date? Uh... Depending on what kind of status update you do, yes. If you do a status update that replaces a previous status, you have to update the true date of the previous status. So it makes your application um, at one point a bit more um, complicated because you have to handle these updates. On the other hand, it makes uh, your database queries a lot easier. Thank you. More questions? Any more questions? Yeah. Databases can have uh, different uh, data types, so can have a different range. If you put something like uh, 2400, maybe it can get it done, because uh, you go out of its range and uh, yeah. can get uh, an, an error. So well, I, uh, for, for putting this 2400 there, I've, I've taken a look at a lot of databases, and uh, most of them, I, I'm not saying all of them, because I have not taken a look at all databases, but most databases support uh, 2,400. It's <laughs> Thank you. But indeed, uh, there, is, there is an issue there. You have to be careful. Yes, uh, I'm usually use Django to manage uh, models, and um, I, I use SARS for, <laughs> for migrations. <laughs> And uh, I wanted to know if uh, with uh, SQL Alchemy, I have something uh, as for to handle migrations, the database migrations or model. Yeah, there is the, uh, there is the um, let's say, uh, uh, the older project for database migrations is SQL Alchemy Migrate, um, which is a, it's a good tool. It, it works very well. Um, but there's a new kit on the block, uh, and that's the Alembic library which is written by Michael Bayer, the author of SQL Alchemy. So probably a lot of people will jump ship um, to, to this new tool, I don't know. Um, but there are two tools that you can use to, uh, to handle database migrations. And it will work with, uh, with what you explained during the talk? Well, um, to be honest, I, I, I myself, I never trust those database migration tools. I write... Uh, <laughs> If I have a database migration, I, I write the SQL to, the, to do the migration myself. Uh, because database migrations is, is a complex thing. And the idea that you can uh, have some magical tool that solves it uh, automatically, I think it's, it's false. It, it will bring you in, in trouble. Um, so these tools can help you. Like, for example, SQL Alchemy Migrate or Alembic. They put a version number in the database. So you can look at this version number and then you can execute an SQL script. Um, but to create automatic diffs, yeah, you can do it, but um, I, I, would, I would not do that on a production system. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
Uh, I would like to ask about um, vertical scaling. Have you had uh, experience with um, how to how vertical scaling will reflect in in the ORM design? Will it be visible in any? Ideally, maybe not. Excuse me. Uh, but if you have a ver vertical scaling yeah. uh, with this ORM model, yeah. it means uh, different objects will go to if different uh, database instances. Yes. So if there is a foreign keys, for example, should this ORM system handle all things automatically? Well, it's a good question. Um, obviously, um, yeah, your database won't, will no longer be able to handle um, certain things um, like um, deleting related rows uh, when, the, when the base row is deleted. Now the SQL Alchemy ORM gives you a number of possibilities that, that can assist you in this. So in SQL Alchemy you have the, the, the cascading of operations between, between objects. You have on one part the cascading happens at the database level. Yeah? which no longer works in your case because of the vertical scaling. But you can also do cascading on the ORM level. Yeah? So then you have to be careful to define the cascading at the ORM level so that the ORM can, define, for example, delete all related records when the base record is deleted. So SQL Alchemy has, has features that, uh, that assist you in doing so. Okay, thank you. Okay, no more questions? Okay, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, and Eric. <laughs>